for our calling. It's not about the circumstances of this day, but it's about un being unmuted. No, we can talk to everybody. Here's a thought for us. When was this written? When was this written? How long, Lord, must I call for your help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict and bounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, so the justice is perverted. Look, watch, and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if I had told you. When was that written? Yesterday? Today? How about 610 B.C. in the book of Habakkuk? Scripture is still timeless, amen? It is certainly relevant, amen? It abounds in amongst what's going on. Stand as we were encouraged amongst that this morning. In this time,
today we're going to celebrate communion. And I'll give you some further instructions on that here in a minute. Um, but there's a, a new uh, Bible study that we're having on Wednesday nights. And um, there's, a, there's just a short video clip that I want to that I want to show you um, that, that you just might be interested in signing up and, um, and joining that class. So here, just just, just watch this for just a second. Grace and, and I finally trusted in the Lord's salvation. I ended up going to Bible college and I started working in the church at the age of 21. But after being a youth pastor for about eight years, I started to feel very stagnant in my faith. I found myself asking if there was any more to the Christian life than just knowing that you're saved and uh, working hard to tell others about it. I just wanted more, you know? So about six years ago, a friend who had recently come to faith in Christ he asked me what I was reading to grow in my knowledge of the Lord, and I very sheepishly had to admit that I wasn't reading much at all. He began to tell me about some books and podcasts that he found to be really intriguing and wanted me to check them out so we could talk about them later. So I began to listen, read, and learn some of the historic doctrine of the Christian faith. And as I studied, I began to notice a change in me. The only the only way I can describe it is it's like my eyes have been opened to the richness of the Word of God. I found that the Bible was a never-ending well of truth and life, and it was just waiting for me to drink from it. I really felt like I had become a Christian all over again. Now, if this is your story, I want to tell you about core Christianity. Whether you've been a Christian for 20 minutes or 20 years, if you're just starting your faith journey, or if you've been feeling stagnant in your faith, if you're wanting more, begin with this class. Because in Core Christianity, you're going to look at 10 of the most essential doctrines in historic Christianity. You're going to dive deep into them so that you can see clearly from God's Word what these doctrines are and why they matter. You'll find that this new knowledge of God only serves to revitalize your times of worship and even lead you to live differently. As the Apostle Paul writes in almost every one of his letters, our prayer for you is the same, that you may increase in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts in light, that you may know the hope to which He has called you through. So if you're one of those people that, you know, maybe it's maybe been a Christian for forever, um, and you've just kind of forgotten where you started from, or maybe you were someone who's new to the faith and um, you need some grounding, you want something to get, kind of get started with, um, this is going to be a great series of classes. So um, we're just now starting out, so if you're interested at all, or think you might be interested at all, um, you can sign up back there in the back, uh, show up on Wednesday night, we've got several folks, um, so you guys can, um, can take advantage of this um, if you're interested. So just want to let everyone know about that again, and, um, and please prayerfully consider it. Also, um, church work day is on September 12th, and this is going to be an inside and outside work day, so we're going to be working outside and inside both. Um, and um, also, we're needing some help in some different areas, greeters, nursery, um, early explorers downstairs, um, and someone helping clean. Uh, Marion said that she's, she's struggling to try to find some people to help come in and clean the pews and stuff, so um, if you could do that, we'd totally appreciate that. Um, and then also the the hiding plates are in your bulletin today, um, so just a reminder you can use the hiding store, um, pay a dollar and eight nine cents or dollar ninety nine, um, and feed uh, someone for a meal. So those things are also available. Okay, um, um, let's pray, and then we'll have a praise team come in the worship. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us today. Thank you for the sunshine and the change in the weather and the coming change in the season. Well, we know that, that it's all in your hands. The word says that you call the rain, cause the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous all. And we are so grateful for everything that you do, for every blessing you pour out, for every direction that you give. May we never ever take you for granted. In Jesus' name, amen.
this partake of it. chapters are all about holiness and how to live holy and how to live holy in your in your relationship with other people, how to live holy in your marriages, how to live holy in the workplace, how to live holy in society. And and there's a kind of a, a theme with Peter, he says when he says, and even the whole New Testament, when he says there's this and then there's this and then there's this and then there's this and you, and you see you see this, Paul writes like this. He's, he's like, take off and put on. And, and there's, there's always this, 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 this two kind of two-fold scenario going on. And of course, the Bible calls it the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And so when we think about our Christianity, when we think about our walk with God, when we think about our faith and how we live out that faith, we must understand the two kingdoms. If you don't understand the two kingdoms, you're going to get confused. When I first became a Christian, I did not understand the two kingdom thing. I, I, I thought I was just going to be magically transformed. And God was just going to hit me with this little wand, and I was just going to boop, and I'm just going to be this perfect little kid that's running. I mean, and that didn't happen. What happened was I woke up the next day and I realized I was still in the same house that I was in before. <laughs> And I realized the same stuff was still in my refrigerator that was there the day before. And I raised up, and all of a sudden, you, you, start to, you start to understand and recognize that I started hanging out with Christian people, you know, those church people. And I started hanging out with them, and they're, and they're all, you know, they're all telling me, you know, well, you shouldn't do this, you can't do that, and I wouldn't try that, and maybe 
you ought to leave that alone. And, and all of a sudden, now I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm about two years into my faith, I'm, I'm in this dilemma. Because I'm living in two worlds. And I've got two lives going on. And I've got this split personality. I felt like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I was over here and I was doing this. And then I was over here and I was doing this. And it was a, it was a, it was, it's a rat race. Right? And it, and it happens. And it happens to Christian people all the time. And part of the reason why it happens to us is that we don't understand the, this concept of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. We just don't get that. And so we think that everything is, you know, just supposed to be fine. Jesus even acknowledges this. He says, I don't pray, Father, that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them while they're in the world. Keep them from the evil one. And so it helps if we can start to understand this idea of there's a kingdom of darkness and there's a kingdom of light. God, of course, is the king of the kingdom of light. And if you have any science in your, in your, or any practicality at all, you understand and you know that light dispels darkness. Always. There's no exceptions. There's no exceptions. I told you the story about our honeymoon when we were in the cave, right? We're in this cave and we're all crammed in this one spot. This, I'm claustrophobic, by the way. But it was my honeymoon, right? And my new bride. She thinks we ought to go into this cave. And when we walk in, the thing was as big as this room. And I'm going, yeah, I can handle this. But as we ventured into it, us and 12 other people, we realized that pretty soon it got closer and closer and closer. And the next thing, we were all crammed in this one little spot. And then the, 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 the guy who was running the show, who was leading us, got, thought he was smart, shut the lights up. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Whoa! He said, this is what it would have been like when the first Sputnikers would have been crawling through these caves in the early days. He said they wouldn't have had light. They would have just been feeling their way around. <clears throat> and I've never been in so dark a place as when I was in that cave with the lights out. I mean, there was absolutely nothing there, no light at all. You could not see your hand in front of your face. And the darkness began to overwhelm me, and, I, and, I was, and I'm starting to sweat. I'm thinking, all right, man, you got about 10 seconds. I'm going to be busting out of here. <laughs> and all of a sudden, boop, on came the light. And the darkness was instantly gone, instantly gone. When we think and consider the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness, we we must understand that concept as well. That the light is stronger and more powerful than the darkness. Always. There's no exceptions. It's always more powerful. Always. Always. And so when we're walking with God and when we're trying to understand what this battle that we're facing is, it's a battle between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And the battle isn't over your salvation. The battle is over your, the way you look and the way you act and the way you live in front of other people. Because if the devil can get the children of God to act like the devil, then he wins. Automatically he wins. So holiness is how we live and how we walk in the kingdom of light. That's how God calls us to live. He says, be holy because I am holy. As a reflection of who God is, and as a reflection of his, his presence and his light on this earth, we are to live as holy people. And so Peter goes through all these different areas of our life and tells us how to live holy. He even tells us how to live holy in the midst of suffering and struggles and trials. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. Now he comes to the end of the book, and he's, and he's starting to wrap things up. And he says, I, want, I, I just want to give you some final thoughts on this whole concept of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, and the reality that we are dealing with in it. So here we go. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. He says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. 
Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. For your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to, to be his, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then he gives his final greeting. By, by Salanus, um, the faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting you and declaring that this is the true grace of God. So stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, that's the church in, in Rome, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings as so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Peace be to you all. To our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So he's wrapping up his letter. And he wants to hit the high points. And he wants to kind of get us thinking on the right, on the right path. All right. So number one in your outline, we should humble ourselves before God. Humble yourself. When you humble yourself, you are, you recognize your place. You recognize your position. You recognize who is over you and who is in authority over you. So to be humble is to recognize that God, the creator of heaven and earth, that God is who he says he is and that he is bigger than me. And that he's stronger than me, and that he's wiser than me, and, 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 and everything other than me. He's beyond us. We can't, we can't reach him without faith in Christ. He's bigger than I am. And so as I, as I think about this whole idea of humility, and as I think about how to humble myself before God, I, I can look at the trees, I can look at the grass, I can look at the sky. This morning I was driving, and I'm, and I'm looking, and the wind started blowing from the south, and I thought, oh, no, no, I'm not a direction of You know, it wasn't. But, but, you know, you think those things, right? The, the tree starts shaking again, and I'm going, oh, boy, yeah. But that was God, you know? And the verse came to me that said that God, you're the, you're the one who causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. It, you're in control of this. You know what's going on. And not just here in Iowa, but globally. And not just globally, but universally. And so the one that we're dealing with, the one that we're communicating with, the one that we're coming to is vastly greater than us. Vastly greater than us. And yet the Bible says that if God is for us, then who could be against us? Amen. So if I have the vastly greater on my side, then what do I have to worry about? It's only when you don't understand the vastly greater and you're unwilling to humble yourself under him that you struggle with life, that you struggle with fear and anxiety. That you struggle because there isn't anything bigger. There isn't anything that's going to take care of you. There isn't anything to, to lead you, to guide you. There isn't any truth that you can follow. There is nothing absolute. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. See? And all the stuff that humans build ultimately crumbles and falls apart. And so there's so much insecurity in our world today because we thought that we had it made. And we thought that we were safe. And we thought that nothing could ever happen to us. Nothing could come against us. Nothing Oops. A little teeny tiny bug that you cannot even see with your eyes has stricken the world with panic and fear. I'm going to compare that little teeny tiny bug to God. Hmm. Yeah. You see what I mean? That's, that we have to have the right perspective. And we have to be able to humble ourselves underneath that, that authority, that power, that presence of God. The next thing, number two, we must learn to trust in God's care. Cast your anxieties on him because he wants to laugh at you and make fun of you. 
He wants to slap you around. He wants to make you feel stupid. No, because he cares for you. The one who created the heavens and the earth cares about you. In fact, the Bible says that he even has the numbers of hair on our head. He knows the number. He knows that I've only got about three. <laughs> he knows that. And, and he's aware of that. And, and, yeah, and, 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 and I can't believe it, and I don't understand it, and I can't deserve it, and I don't earn it, but he bestows that on me. He cares about me. So I can cast my anxieties on to him. I can cast them, and I can. And that's the power and the authority that Christ has given us to cast our cares. He says, bring them to me. Bring them to me. Bring them to me. Yet we lump these things around and we get weighed down by them and we get distracted by them and we end up on medications because, I mean, come on. Take it to God and let him have it. Well, that means we have to humble ourselves. And that means we have to trust. And that means there has to be some absolutes. And that means God is true. Oh. Cast your cares upon him. For he cares for you. Number three, we must be aware of the spiritual battle. Paul says that we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And we must understand that this kingdom of light and this kingdom of darkness, there are, there is the physical realm of this. One is the church and one is the unchurched. But there's also the spiritual realm. And, there, and, and what we can't see with our with our eyes, is happening around us. And there is a very real adversary, and there is a very real Savior, and they are both very much alive and well, and we are called to choose, and we're called to be aware. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is the manifestation of the Spirit, the, the proof of the outworking of the Spirit in our lives is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. And when these things are actively alive and being released into your life, you, can, you, can, you know that that's coming from the Spirit of Christ. The fruit of the devil, if you want to say it that way, which I really don't, but it is anxiety, fear, lust, greed, worry. Right? You see the difference there? You see how it you see how the kingdom of light has its set of, of characteristics and its set of gifts and its set of way of living and the kingdom of darkness has its set and its way of living. If you're living in fear, if you're living in anxiety, if you're living in frustration, if you're living in anger, if you want to kill somebody, you're living in the kingdom of darkness. You're not living in the kingdom of light. Right? You've been sucked in. If you're a Christian, you've been deceived, you've been lied to, you've been sucked in. Somehow, you've you've not recognized or understood or engaged in the battle that's taking place in your heart and your mind. And we must do that. We must engage. We cannot just sit by idly while the world just steamrolls over us. We must engage. We must call a skunk a skunk. I mean, if it looks like a skunk, and it smells like a skunk, and it acts like a skunk, it's a skunk. And I don't care what kind of lipstick you want to put on it or what kind of perfume you want to dump on it. I don't care how you want to treat it. It's still a skunk. So why are we calling it a puppy dog? See? We must be willing. We must be aware. We must be awake to the battle that's going on for the hearts and souls of men in our world and in our country. We must be aware of it. Peter here says, be sober-minded. And sober-minded means to be focused on the truth. Focus. It's like a laser beam. I'm focused, I'm focused on the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set you, free. Set you free, babe. And you want to be free, right? I want to be free. Anybody here want to be a, want, not want to be free? Just raise your hand. We all want to be free. Right? We're used to freedom. We like freedom. Christ says if you know the truth, then the truth is going to set you free. Right? You know the truth about things. 
That's why we need to be aware. That's why we need to be sober-minded. Investigate. Do some looking around. Don't be afraid to, to ask somebody else what they think. Don't be afraid to pick up a book and look at it. Don't be afraid to do some investigation. And if something is a lie, then it's a lie. And it comes from hell. The kingdom of darkness. If something is truth, then it is always truth. And it comes from the kingdom of light. And, and it's, it's, it's the more you live as a believer, the more distinct these things become. And the easier it becomes to see these things because the Spirit is showing, oh, that's not right. That's, and, and listen to me. The devil's nickname is Slick. He's Slick. <laughs> and he will try and try and try and try. But Christ is living in us. Okay? So, the roaring lion, the devil... He's looking for weakness, right? He's looking for weakness. He's, the, the Bible says he's the father of lies. He's the master liar. He is the, he is the perpetrator of the lie. He's the king liar, okay? And he comes to kill, and he comes to steal, and he comes to destroy. Well, who does he come to kill, steal, and destroy? The church, right? Amen. He don't care about those people out there. They're already his. And he's not a I mean, he's not, he, he's just, he's just leading them down this path. But he's after us. Because we are the resistance. We are the body of Christ. We are the army of God. We are God's children. And we are the ones that are called to take a stand and to stand for the truth. Of course the enemy's going to be upset with us. Of course he doesn't want us out there blabbering around. Of course he wants to suck us into his void. But Peter says, just be aware of this. It's happening. It's happening all around us. And we need to be aware. Just be aware. Just be aware. Number four, the believer should resist the devil's attack. Resist him. Resist. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brothers throughout the world. Resist. How do we resist? Well, this idea of resist, I think it comes from... Um, comes from the idea of <clears throat> repent. The more I thought about it, the more I think re resist and repent are similar. I'm going to resist. How am I going to resist? Well, I'm going to be resisting by turning away from them. Look, there's not a single solitary person in this room, including myself or anybody else, that is strong enough to take on the devil in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You just won't win. You just can't. And this whole idea of resisting means to change your focus. Turn away from what is there. No, I am not going to do that. See? And then but don't be sitting there going, I'm not going to do that, 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 now I'm doing it. See, that doesn't help. When you focus on something, you eventually will do it. Right? So to sit around and focus on all the things that I'm not supposed to be doing before you know it, you're going to be doing them. You've got to get your mind off those things, and that's resisting. I'm going to turn away, and I'm going to look a different direction. I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to take a different direction, right? I'm going to move away from that. How do I do that in my walk with God? Well, one of the greatest things that I've found is to worship. I just begin to worship God, you know? Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Right? And all of a sudden, I'm refocusing. Right? I'm refocusing on the Father. I'm refocusing on who He is. I'm refocusing on my relationship. I'm refocusing. Okay? So worship is a great way to do it. Um, Bible study? Anybody for that? Yeah, of course. So when 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 I, when I come to temptation or when I come to being trying to be lied to or trying to be duped, I come to the Word of God because this is the truth. Right? And you can only come back a lie with the truth. Another lie doesn't fix the first lie. My mom used to tell me all the time, don't lie to me because you hate me. Just tell me the truth right off the bat and we'll deal with it. But don't lie to me. Because she understood that when you tell one lie, 
Then you got to tell another lie to cover up for that lie. And then you got to tell another lie to cover up for that lie. And then another lie. And pretty soon, you're just a big fat lie. Right? So don't start that. Don't start that path. Stay with the truth. Stay with the Word of God. Worship, scripture, service. Get yourself doing something. You know, call a friend. Take someone out for lunch. Come, come here. Clean pews. Okay? We'll turn on some rocking Christian music for you. And you can just sit in here and clean pews and clean pens and just get your mind off of whatever it was that you were focused on. That's, that's driving you down. That's driving you down. Christian fellowship. Fellowshipping with one another is a critical element in our resisting the devil. Look, you got a group of 5,000 people sitting here. They're going to be pretty strong together, right? You got one person sitting over here. Who's going to be stronger, the 5,000 or the one? The 5,000, of course. And that one person is easy picking. And the enemy will just come along and just say, you know, you're off doing things that you never thought you would do. And, and you're going, I can't believe I'm going. I can't. But who are you telling? Who are you going to talk to? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go for support? Where are you going to go for help? Where are you going to go for prayer? Where are you going to go? You're all by yourself. No. We need each other. We need the body. That's how God designed it. That's how he put it together. And that's what we, that's what we must cling to. We must cling to one another. Christian fellowship is critical in our resisting the devil. And, and you've got to find someone within that Christian fellowship that you can be totally honest with. That you can just say, you know what, I'm struggling with this today. And I don't know what to do with this. I don't know where, and someone who won't judge you and who won't give you a bunch of dumb advice, but who will just come alongside of you and kneel down and pray with you and seek the Father with you and encourage you. That's what you need. You've already beaten yourself up. You need someone to come along and to pull you out of that and to encourage you. Number five, suffering has a season. It has a season. And after you have suffered for a little while, don't ask me what a little while is. Because <laughs> I don't know. That's up to God. But the suffering is for a season. And it's for a reason. Oh, there you go. That's a new one. It's for a season and a reason. I need the third one. Oh. <laughs> it's to grow us. We, you've got you to admit that during the stress and during the suffering times, we, if we do it right, we grow the most then. Because that's when we're seeking God. That's when we're seeking God hard. That's when, we're, that's when, we, when we need something from Him. And when we get to that point and God begins to reveal Himself and God begins to move and God begins to speak and God begins to answer, then, all, then it's like, yes, 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 yes. And you just take a step, right? And you move forward in your walk with God, in your relationship with Him. And then the suffering backs off, and we get to enjoy what we've learned, and we get to investigate what we've learned, and then suffering comes again, and we learn something new and something different. It's a cycle. But it's a cycle of, of growth. It's a cycle of success. I don't know if you know any, kid, any little boys between the ages of three and seven, but a lot of times they'll complain that their legs ache. Mommy, my legs hurt, my legs hurt, my legs hurt. Take them to the doctor, and the doctor says, yeah, they're growing. They're growing. And sometimes growth involves pain. You know, but when that kid's seven foot tall and he's playing for the NBA, now that pain will go away. You don't even know it, right? You don't even know it. All right, number six. God will restore our brokenness. I love this verse. Let's read it together. Ready? The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Don't you love that verse? There's, this is such a promise. God said, I, I will. Earlier, he, he 
who says, God cares for you. Now he takes this caring to a whole different degree. God himself will, God himself will, will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. God will do that. In the kingdom of light. <laughs> and you will be established in your faith and your walk with God. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful thing to experience. It's a beautiful thing to restore. To restore means to put things in their appropriate position. We restore it. We put it back. We put it back. Like, like if I'm going to restore Mark for worship, i got to put this back. Right there. It's right. See, I'm, now I've restored it. Over here, it's out of place. God, when he found us, floundering around in our sinfulness, we're out of place. We weren't in the place that God created us to be. We weren't in the place that God designed us to be. We weren't in the place that God wants us to be. We weren't in the place that God created for us to be. He moves us, and he moves us over here, and he says, I want you to be in my kingdom. I want you to be a part of the kingdom of life. I want you to know the love, the joy, the peace, the goodness, the graciousness, the hope, the, the glory of me. I want you to know that. I want you to experience that. I want you to have that life. I want you to have that life. So God himself is going to restore us. He's going to put us in that right place. Confirm. Confirm means to turn resolutely in a certain direction. God himself is going to confirm us. He's going to give, give us the power to, to turn resolutely to him. To come to him, to follow him, to know him, to walk with him, to experience the love and the grace and the joy and the peace that comes from knowing Christ. It's confirmation. Confirmation. God says, yes, you are mine. And he seals us with the Holy Spirit. Right? That's what the Bible teaches. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. People are worried about the, the mark and all this stuff. And should I take the little chip and all the yada yada. You know what? Right there. I've already been marked. I've already been marked. I'm the son of a living God. And it's nothing that I did because I can't write about it. He put his mark on me. He did. And he didn't do it with a branding iron. He did it with a kiss. Precious in his eyes. He hates it when we mess around in the kingdom of darkness. To strengthen it means to confirm in spiritual knowledge and power. To confirm in spiritual knowledge and power. In other words, to engage in the battle. Okay? To engage in the battle. In other words, to be able to say no to the things of the kingdom of darkness. To be able to walk away from those things. To be able to say, oh, you know what? That's not who I am. And to be able to live in this new identity. To be able to live as God created us to live. And that is the way he wants us to live. Right? And to establish means to ground or to settle. Boom! It's done. Drop the mic. Walk away. It's done. When Jesus bowed his head on the cross, he said what? It is finished. It is finished. No greater words have ever been uttered in the history of mankind than those words. It is finished. It is finished. And in 2000 or 1981, Doug Van Lee is going to come to me. I want you. It's set. It's set. The Bible says neither height nor depth nor powers nor principalities or things present or things come or things above the earth or things below the earth can ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. It's done. It's finished. It's set. In God's mind, it's settled. And when in God's mind, it's settled, it's settled. And the devil can kick and fuss and scream and cry and whine and do all the things that he wants to do. But it's done. Christ is saved. He's brought you into the kingdom of light. And he's empowered us and he's equipped us to live in the kingdom of light. The last one, Peter wants us to live in peace. 
just live in peace. And may the peace that surpasses all understanding guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Peace. God calls us to live in His kingdom, the kingdom of life. And in His kingdom, there is peace. On Friday, we and I were fishing, and we were, and we were sitting on a boat, having a snack, a sandwich. And we were, we were underneath the tree, and it was about probably 80 degrees, maybe, with, with a slight wind blowing. And we're sitting underneath this tree. We're tied off, and the shade is coming over us, so we're not out in the sun. We're just sitting there, and I'm and I'm just sitting there. And Leo was talking, and I said, "Shh." <laughs> just listen. Just listen. And it was the water ripple, and the leaves on the tree. Blue Jay over here, calm. And another bird over here, calm. And a splashing of fish over here. And at that moment, I was in the peace that surpassed all understanding. I couldn't understand the peace. I just sat there with goosebumps, going, This is peace. It's peace. That's what God wants for us in our lives. He wants us to live in peace. Peace with ourselves, peace with Him, and peace with other human beings. Live in peace. Walk in the kingdom. Trust God for every moment of every day of your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us today. Thank you for the words that came from Peter, that came from you, that came through Peter, that are on the pages of this book that we can have, that we can know experience. And I thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. I pray that you would continue to open our eyes to the kingdom of light. That we might walk in your peace.